Welcome friends, welcome back to the hangar. Um, today we're going to do story time. And this is a difficult one to tell because, you know, you have to admit some vulnerability. Um, you have to admit that, you know, things started to go wrong. Um, and that you almost had an incident, but you didn't have an incident. I didn't have an incident because I knew what to do. And I think I need to share this story so that you know what to do. Um, it's one of those things that if you read accident reports every month in the in the flying magazines, the plane and pilot magazines, whatever, they always have a bunch of stories in the front. The Copa magazine has stories in the front of incidents. And all too often you see an incident where uh, a pilot ends up doing a forced landing into a field or onto a road or, you know, off airport somewhere. And upon further inspection of the aircraft, they can't find anything that's wrong. Light bulb always goes off in my head. Carb ice, and depending on the aircraft, if it's a 172 built prior to March of 1972, was it vapor lock? And so this happened to me uh, sort of middle of April, April 12th, beautiful day. Um, I had a meeting up in Perry Sound, so I was flying from Oshawa to Perry Sound, and I was going to stop at Aurelia Rama, do a touch and go, and then continue on to Perry Sound. Um, like I said, beautiful day. Blue sky day. The ground temperature when I left was 20 degrees, 21 degrees Celsius, which is, what, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's quite warm for that early in the, in the season for that day in April. That's quite a warm temperature. And so that temperature might come into play later. So we were at altitude. I didn't have the cameras on this day. I should always fly with cameras on. So I'm going to do the best to tell the story, recreating it with the data um, that I get from the aircraft. Because I've got the Dynon system, full engine management system, it tracks and logs everything. At the end of every flight, I plug in a USB stick, I take that information home, and I plug it into Flight Savvy. I hang on to the files, plug it into Flight Savvy. I've got all of the information for every flight I've ever done in Mike Victor uniform, um, second by second by second by second. So I left here and climbed to just over 4,000 feet pressure altitude. Um, quite warm. Wasn't really thinking about density altitude, just me in the plane, full fuel, otherwise empty, well within the flight envelope of the aircraft. And so before I left that day, full walk around, sump both of the tanks, and I sump the fuel strainer under the engine, fuel is clear. Tanks are full. I dip the tanks, tanks are full. I had flown a couple days before and filled the tanks before I put the plane back in the hangar. So I had full tanks. If there was any water or debris in the fuel, it would have shown up through the sumps. Clean. Do my walk around checks, do my run up, do everything, fly out of Oshawa, climb to just over 4,000 feet, and I cruise along to about a town called Brecklin. When I get to Brecklin, my flight plan had been to uh, drop down to about 3,000 feet, fly at about 3,000 feet into Aurelia. Um, so, as you can see from the engine data, pull the power in order to start my descent. At the same time I pull the power to start the descent, I also pull on the carb heat, and you can see the carb heat increasing on the graph. When I get down to about 3,000 feet, opposite, back on the power, carb heat off. And I'm looking out the window, um, because at Breckland there are two airstrips. Um, one is a friend of Chris, my AME. Um, a friend of Chris's, and he's got a uh, he's got a shop there. He rebuilds aircraft, and he's got a couple of grass strips. And then right beside him is a farm, a couple of grass strips. Also at Brecklin, which does me no good, he he has um, essentially a pond that he has dug out that is the shape of a runway so that he can bring in float planes. Doesn't do me any good. So I'm looking out the window at that. I just get past Brecklin, and the engine starts to run rough, really rough, really quickly. Immediately, right hand goes over to the three knobs that are that are grouped together on my aircraft. Mixture rich, carb heat on, and I check the primer, make sure that it's locked. Those three things are done. My hand immediately goes down to the fuel valve. I've got it on both. I'm doing a little bit of mental math in my head. I'm looking at the panel and I realize that when I was at 4,000 feet, 4,500 feet, um, my density altitude was over 5,000. Now, this is a 1961 Cessna 172. Um, 
it has a fuel system, and I'll throw up a picture of the fuel system. It has a fuel system that was flawed. And in 1972, there was an airworthiness directive issued, an AD issued, for all Cessna 172s built prior to March 1972. And part of that AD was you had to do one of two things. One thing was to replumb the fuel system between the tank and the fuel switch. Um, my understanding is not many people did that. The other thing that you could do instead of replumbing, because replumbing you had to buy a kit, um, you had to pay an AME, it was like a 40 hour deal in order to pull the plane apart and put all of the parts in and not many people did that. And the owners of this aircraft did not do that. The second thing that you needed to do in lieu of the actual repair was put a sticker on the fuel selector valve and the sticker on the fuel selector valve says at altitudes above 5,000 feet you must operate on one tank or the other. You can't operate it on both. I had it on both because I was at 4,500 feet. But density altitude was above that. I was above 5,000 in density altitude. Hadn't really occurred to me that that was a thing, um, but it might have been. And so the idea with this is the fuel comes from the tanks, gravity fed, one, one line from each tank down each side, they meet in the middle at the fuel selector valve. What they found and through incident after incident after incident was with this aircraft above 5,000 feet, you would get vapor lock in the fuel line from the tank and the fuel selector valve. So somewhere between the fuel selector valve and the tank, a bubble would form of fuel vapor, which stopped or slowed the flow of fuel from the tank to the engine. Um, and by running it, either on left or right above 5,000 feet, what that allowed was one tank not to be running fuel at all. So if there was a vapor lock bubble, it would dissipate and then you would switch. And so I've got the Dynon set up. Every 30 minutes, it tells me to switch tanks. I didn't do it this day because I thought I'm not above 5,000 feet. This is running through my brain. Um, so this all starts, you can see on the graph, at one o'clock and 54 seconds. Engine's running really rough. You can see the carb heat start to come up. Um, I'm also scanning all of the other values on my engine management system. I'm looking at uh, the oil temperature and pressure, the cylinder head temperatures, the exhaust gas temperatures, the fuel amount. I know that I'm full of fuel, but of course I'm checking that as well. And I'm watching, I'm watching the fuel flow jump up and down with the, um, with the changes in the RPM. And of course, while I'm circling, I also cycled through the magnetos, checked left or right to see if it was a problem with the magneto. It wasn't a problem with the magneto. Now you'll see from my flight track, at about the point the engine starts to run rough, I'm immediately initiating a turn. And I'm initiating that turn to come back to Brecklin. And I circle Brecklin for about six minutes as this issue works its way through. So I switch over to the left tank. The engine's still running rough. That's expected. It's expected because if there was a uh, if there was vapor lock, it would have been in both lines at the same time, and it would still be in the left tank line. And I'm waiting for the right tank line to clear out. Really, not much I can do at this point. But I know that I'm not in that much trouble. I mean, even though the engine is running really rough, the lowest RPM that I'm seeing is about a thousand RPM, and I'm not losing altitude. Um, this plane glides incredibly well. We did the wing work. We added the wing extensions. We added the stole cuff. We added all of those other things. This plane really glides. And in fact, you can see that I'm actually gaining altitude because I'm pulling back a little bit. I'm thinking if I can gain a little bit of altitude, I might be able to buy myself a few seconds at the very end if I actually have to put this into the field or down onto the Breckland airfield. Counting down in my head counting down in my head, counting down in my head, and then I switch to the right-hand fuel tank. At the moment that I switch to the right-hand fuel tank, the major roughness goes away. The engine's still running rough. It's still, you know, shuddering, and, but I'm not getting those giant drops in RPM. I'm not getting that surging of roughness. At about the second turn, it all clears up. And you can see a fuel spike at that moment. Um, as the fuel starts to flow back through the system and fill everything downstream of the fuel flow meter. 
So at the same time, you can see that the carb heat has gone, has shot way up. So was it carb ice? Quite probably could have been carb ice. Was it vapor lock? Quite probably could have been vapor lock. It could have been both of those things. It could have been neither of those things. Probably one or the other. We'll never know. Um, I have sent this away for analysis and I've been told that it was more than likely vapor lock and they can tell that by that spike in fuel flow as the fuel starts flowing really quickly again and fills everything up downstream of the flow meter. Now, I know that, um, I know that the vapor lock thing is, is, is a touchy one. I looked a lot online and I saw a lot of people spreading, you know, misinformation at best misinformation, disinformation at worst. Um, a lot of people saying, oh, I've been flying for years and I've never heard of this, it's not a problem. Other people saying, read the POH. If it's not in the POH, then it's not a problem. Other people saying, and I can find no reference of this through further research, <laughs> saying that it's, it's not a thing, it's just, you know, Cessna came up with this story about vapor lock to, to appease the FAA and they put out the AD and nobody actually fixed it. They just put on the sticker and you don't have to worry about it. And other people are saying flat out, the sticker's only there to make sure that you manage the fuel tank on either side because they use fuel in equally. I know that my left tank drains faster than my right tank. But that's not why that sticker is there. That sticker is there because of vapor lock. And other people bring in, oh, well, shouldn't happen in a carbureted engine. And other people say, oh no, it shouldn't happen in a fuel injected engine. And then, and then they argue about fuel injection versus carburetor. It has nothing to do with fuel injection, has nothing to do with the carburetor, has everything to do with the way the fuel is moving through the line between the tank and the switch. Nothing to do with the carburetor. Now, for everyone telling me, um, <laughs> read the POH, it's in the POH, follow the POH. The POH will have all of the information that you need about this problem. Here's the problem, it's not in the POH. This is the POH for this aircraft, 1961 Cessna 172B Skyhawk. There's no mention of it in the, in the POH. And you know why there's no mention of it in the POH? Because they didn't know it was a problem yet. Plain and simple. Took them from 1960 until 1972 before they acknowledged that there was a problem and what the fix would be. So there's no mention of it in the POH because they didn't know it was a problem yet. In fact, um, if you follow the POH, on this aircraft, um, you will find yourself in definite trouble uh, because it tells you to run it with both tanks at all times, which is superseded by the AD. And I had this argument with, uh, with a CFI. Um, after I bought this plane, I flew with a bunch of different CFIs, getting you know, different instruction, uh, making sure that I was you know, not rusty. And a couple of those CFIs were fantastic, but one of them, I flew with them once and he argued about the POH over and over and over again, that all the information I needed to fly the plane was in the POH. And when I tried to tell him that it was wrong, the POH was wrong um, because none of the stall speeds were correct. None of the landing speeds were correct. And that there were a couple of ADs that superseded the information in the POH. He yelled and screamed at me and said that I didn't know what I was talking about, that I had to do what was in the POH and that's the only way that you can fly the plane. Um, I landed immediately. And that was the last I ever saw of him. So this POH tells you to fly on both tanks at all times, superseded by the AD. Um, and these things aren't retroactive. So in 1972, just because they issued that AD and told you to fly on a single tank operation above 5,000 feet, doesn't mean that this magically corrects itself. This was done in 1960 for the 1961 model year, and it's wrong. Um, in fact, uh, most of the stuff that's in this book at this point doesn't match what this airplane does or how it works. I carry it because legally I have to, but it doesn't really say anything. This is for a 1976 Skyhawk after the AD, and again, doesn't say anything about um, what to do with vapor lock because they've changed the fuel plumbing by that point, negating the need for that sort of uh, information in the POH. It doesn't happen with the later aircraft because they, uh, they changed the way that the tanks are vented. And that's another thing. Um, there's another AD for this aircraft to add vented fuel caps. That was done. When we rebuilt this plane, we put the vented fuel caps on. Up until that point, they weren't vented. Um, so that's done as well. So that's also not a problem here. So the POH is great. Um, 
but if you fly completely according to the POH in one of these older aircraft, it might come back and bite you in the butt. So what does this mean? What have I changed? What did I learn? Um, I learned that from now on, um, in my checklists, I've made changes. Um, all of my checklists are on the iPad, uh, mostly because, again, you can buy checklists for this aircraft, and I've got one here, really nice checklist, all made up, completely wrong for this airplane. Um, none of the speeds are correct, and none of the stall speeds are correct. Uh, a lot of the check things that you're supposed to check don't exist in this aircraft anymore because we've got the full uh, glass panel. Totally useless. So it's all on my iPad. Uh, my cruise checklist, when I get to cruise altitude, no matter what cruise altitude I'm at now, I'm going to switch to single tank. I've got that uh, reminder from the Dynon every 30 minutes to switch fuel tanks, and I'm just going to go with that from now on. Um, then I don't have to worry about density altitude. I've also uh, changed my emergency checklist just to make sure that that switch fuel tanks is in there if I get a rough running engine. Um, and I'm making this video because I think this is a misunderstood problem. Uh, there's no way with full fuel tanks and no mechanical problems with your aircraft that you should be having a forced off airport landing that later turns out that it could have been carb ice or vapor lock. And the vapor lock really only applies to Cessna 172s built prior to 1972 that have that sticker. Now, your aircraft, your Cessna 172 from, I don't know, 1968 may not have that sticker. It may have been taken off at some point. Or it may have been replumbed. You need to check if you own one of these aircraft and see if it's been replumbed. If it hasn't been replumbed, put on the sticker. Learn the problem. Know what to do when you get into that situation. And so if you take a look at one of the graphs for carbice um, and how probable carbice is, I was definitely in a zone where carbice was possible. The outside air temperature and the dew point spread was fairly close. Um, I was at risk of, of carb ice in any operating condition, whether I was um, full power or gliding. That's why when I pulled the power, definitely always put the carb, the carb heat on. And I was waiting to see if the carb heat solved the problem, and it might have. That could have been it. Now, one other consideration. This aircraft does have the Peterson MoGas STC, which means I can fly with auto fuel, MoGas, unleaded fuel, um, as long as it doesn't contain ethanol and it's above a certain uh, value. Uh, on this day, I did not have any auto gas in this aircraft. Um, and the reason I want to stress that is, uh, as part of the STC, they go to great pains to tell you that you are at a much greater risk of, of experiencing vapor lock. And even if you do have the, uh, the extra venting, you can still experience vapor lock um, because of the way autogas or mogas reacts um, and boils. But on this day, tanks were full, 100%, 100 low lead. So I guess my hope for this video is that uh, I can help maybe just even one person review their safety procedures and stop even one forced landing at some point in the future because you either got carb ice or some other preventable fixable thing that you could do at altitude. And there's, a, there's an adage that I've heard over and over and over again. Um, do your initial checks and then sit back, wind your watch, and think for a moment about what needs to be done when your engine starts to run rough like that. Um, I didn't wind my watch. As soon as you get into that situation, all bets are off. And you don't know how you're going to react until you're there. And you just have to hope that you can react and get the right things done. And in this case, I did get the right things done. Um, landed safely at Aurelia Rama. Uh, did a full run up um, at Aurelia Rama. And then took off and continued my journey to Perry Sound. Everything's fine. Um, and it's resulted in a change in my safety procedures. In a change in my checklists. And hopefully moving forward, this won't happen again. But if it does, I know. I can, I can get through it. So thanks for stopping by and, uh, and we'll see you again soon.